it was a travesty. It was an absolute travesty that in 2011, 2012, a guy that nobody would ever heard of, uh, that was me, uh, could write an article that could create the biggest coalition for, well, the most exciting, certainly the most libertarian uh, candidate that anyone was really paying attention to. Um, and I, at that point of my life, was actually wondering if I was wasting my education and had been wasting my education too much for too many years and was actually looking uh, to find the meaning in my life. And actually that article, that kind of launched me into political psychology and communication and I discovered my career. And that is why I am here now talking to you. Um, now, I actually uh, decided to support Ron Paul in 2011 very soon, really, just one or two years after I even discovered liberty. Liber discovered liberty in the sense that you all have if you're in this room. Um, discovered the liberty canon, you know, read my Hayek and my Bastiat and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I was kind of high on it uh, right then. And, and of course, once you get high on liberty, you never come down. down. Um, but I was, I was a newbie. And uh, as well as having to educate myself in the principles of liberty, which I now go around the world teaching, I have also uh, taken it upon myself to actually understand those bits of human psychology and history, because in a way, history is human psychology writ large, right? To discover, OK, these ideas, this philosophy, wonderful, a beautiful thing. But how does it actually win or sometimes lose right, supporters in practice? Now, my um, tagline now for what I do as a, as a consultant and political communicator, et cetera, is win Robin Kerner, winning supporters, not arguments. So winning supporters. Now, that's what we're all about. You guys must be really about it because of the time of the morning that you're sitting here on a Sunday. I might, I might reference that a few times. It's only liberty that will get me out of bed at this time on a Sunday morning. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and I, what I want to see the liberty movement do, um, including obviously the LP, it's, I'm delighted you're here, Carla, thank you for coming, um, do, is, is to really uh, focus more on not understanding our philosophy better. We need to always do that but also realize that a massive piece of this puzzle is understanding how to sell, market, brand that philosophy so that it gets picked up in um, large numbers. Or maybe not picked up in large numbers, maybe uh, so that we can culturally and or politically move the dial toward what we care about. Now, this has obviously happened um, many times in history, and we've seen a few moving of the dial significantly uh, instances uh, around the world, in the English-speaking world recently, um, not necessarily for liberty. I'm thinking of the gentleman in the White House, uh, but I'm also thinking, uh, using the word gentleman, I'm, I'm pushing the word a bit, but, um, uh, but also uh, some things that have happened in my native land, which I'm going to reference again in a minute, um, such as the Brexit vote, which I think is a wonderful example of some of the things I want to talk about. Now, I want to suggest that there are really um, eh, three or four principles that govern successful political insurgency. If we're libertarians, uh, that's what we need. We are not mainstream. Our job is to become mainstream. So as I say, looking at psychology, looking at history, what principles, if any, can we extract about how that is done? As I say, I'm going to throw out four. As libertarians, we really like to tell people what we think. We like to tell people what we think in the manner of, let me tell you what you should think. Now, I'm actually kind of excited about what I've heard during this conference in Omaha from a lot of people that, about messaging. There seems to be, I think a dam is breaking in terms of the realization that we need to get good at, that the psychology is important, the sales and marketing of ideas is important. You can have a wonderful product, but if it's not packaged and marketed and sold into the need of the customer, which is what salesmen do, and I was trained in direct sales, and I, I draw on that in my work in politics, then if you don't do that, then it doesn't matter. right? Nobody's going to buy what we've got to sell, however good it is. So that's a word of warning. We're high on rationality, low on empathy. And I say word of warning because it's, as I think you've heard from various speakers this weekend, including, for example, Austin Peterson, just 
to think, think of one that I heard yesterday. Um, it's the empathy that makes the sale. It's the empathy that bridges the identity gap. And I know you've heard that. Um, but uh, you know the 12-step thing? You've got to admit you've got a problem. And if you don't, you know, it's the first step to solving it, right? Empathy is an issue for us, I would say. Now, to come back to we tell people what we think because we want to let them know what they should think. Political insurgencies, I don't think successful ones ever work that way. Rather, a necessary element of a political insurgency seems to be the telling of a critical mass of people what they already feel. It's not what I think, it's what you feel. And when I say telling, that's also not quite the right word. You do have to message to people what they already feel. But more broadly, you're reflecting back to them who they already are. Now, lots of people will feel a lot of things at a given time. So what actually do we reflect back if we want to move the dial of mainstream politics? Well, the best thing you can reflect back to have a political impact on a population is a sense of injustice, a particular offense against a basic human sense of justice that is not mediated by a political ideology. So that's abstract. Let me give you a couple of examples from recent times. Um, well, I've mentioned Trump and Brexit. Let's do Trump and Brexit. Do you remember that Trump got to the shot to the top of his very big Republican pack um, when he made that absolutely outrageous comment, if you listen to the media, about those Mexicans, they're not selling, sending their best people, right? It's all those rapists and baddies and all of that. It was, it was, a, it was a, you could say, a pretty um, horrific comment, and certainly by the time the media had packaged it their way. But I think that was coded language. And I think the proof of it is the fact that he's now our president. I think what he was speaking to was this. It isn't fair that people who break rules get stuff that people like you who don't break rules don't get. That ain't fair to anybody. You don't need a political ideology to feel that that's not fair. In Britain, the Brexit vote, the equivalent was it isn't fair that people you can't vote out of office make laws that govern your lives. Nigel Farage just banged on about that for years. And the media treat, treated Nigel Farage. Do you know Nigel Farage? I think I'm in a room of people who know who he is, right? Yeah, leader of UKIP, a party uh, half the age of the LP set up to get us out of the European Union, right? Success, big political success, right? Um, and also, also, at, at no time has the United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP, had more than one, one member of parliament. It, nearly all of it, and that was also only for a brief time. So basically, UKIP has been a political force with no representatives in office. Right? Think about it. OK, it's kind of an astonishing thing. And yet we had Brexit. What both of those men, Trump and um, uh, Farage, were doing is reflecting back to people this latent sense of injustice. Remember the phrase, liberty and justice for all? They go together. But people don't buy liberty. Right? What they do is they resist the injustice they feel by virtue of not having the liberty. In the sense of, right, I will pay a price to get back something that I think I should have, that I think is mine by right, and I would exercise right now if I had it. Right? But I won't typically pay a price to fight for something that I'm doing quite happily without. And obviously, most people are getting on with their lives. They have enough liberty to live their lives. We're not going to argue them into needing more if they don't feel that need. Well, what you need to do is speak into the prevailing, the already there feeling. That's critical. And I actually think there are examples all the way back through the English-speaking tradition. And I talk about the English-speaking tradition, the Anglosphere, just because that's the one that I know and because it's the language I speak so I can actually do the history in, in that culture. And I, so I, I, I'm confining these big statements to the English-speaking world, which um, I would say uh, 
also, interestingly, um, I'm talking about a 1,000 years of that history. The first constitutional limitation of government in the English-speaking world was the Anglo-Saxon Charter in 1014. Right? It's 201 years before Magna Carta. I would say there's lots of examples of this principle playing out when we've seen step changes towards liberty. But even that isn't all of it. I said four principles. I've given you two. Right? I've given you reflect back how people feel, and specifically, if you can, reflect back a feeling about a sense of injustice that they all already have that isn't mediated by a political ideology. Let me just unpack that a second bit. Not mediated by a political ideology means that they don't think it's an injustice because of their ideology, because of their system of belief. They feel it's an injustice because it, at a human level, right? he's breaking the rules, he's getting stuff from me, I'm not breaking the rules. Right? That's the kind of injustice that you're trying to talk to. Yeah. OK, so the third principle. First two will get you a long way, but they won't create a, political, a, a successful political insurgency that makes a non-mainstream entity like a liberty movement mainstream. No, what you need for that is, if you like, the other side of the coin. You want this injustice that you're targeting to be exacerbated by all of the mainstream political options. Now, think about that. So with Trump and immigration, the Republicans and the Democrats are together equally responsible in anybody's mind for getting the situation to exactly where it is. Because we know that the Democrats have one story and the Republicans have another story. But here we are with this mess after decades of these two parties doing or not doing whatever they say they will do. Um, so tr when Trump speaks to that feeling, he's speaking to a feeling that isn't being spoken to by the political mainstream. Important. Brexit. Right? Let's go back to that example. Exactly the same. You've got a lot of people. doesn't matter what party you belong to. doesn't matter if you're progressive or a conservative. If people can make laws that govern your life and you can't outvote them, that's a pretty basic offense against, uh, or vote them out, I should say. That's a pretty basic offense against uh, democracy. And yet, in England, as Nigel Farage was banging on, trying to get us Brexit, in England, the three main parties, the Conservatives, the Labour Party, and the Liberal Democrats, the three main parties in the UK, oh, and in Scotland, the, social, uh, the SNP, right, the Scottish National Party, are all, give us more Europe, more Europe, more Europe. And the, sometimes the Conservatives would say, well, yeah, we need to negotiate better with Europe. We need to reform it from the inside. But basically, the entire population have heard it before, and all they know that they have no way to vote for actual democracy. So Nigel Farage comes in, and that's his open goal. Open goal, I don't want to make it sound easy. The guy did a lot of work for a couple of decades. But that was why it was possible. Now think about it. What are the open goals with respect to offenses against justice, a basic human sense of justice that we have in the United States, that people who have no interest in political philosophy and certainly couldn't even spell libertarian have? Um, there are a few, and maybe we could talk about them in the question and answers. Um, I think the, uh, the most obvious one, which I actually uh, um, mentioned at a Libertarian Party state convention of my home state of Washington a few years ago, is the cronyism thing, right? And, and I think Trump's used it. Um, you know, I, I, I said in the speech back then to the Washington State uh, LP, um, I said, there seem to me to be two. One is the cronyism. Um, the other is, uh, it was kind of when Snowden was, you know, was kind of getting big, uh, is that whole issue of intrusion. Um, and I said, but the biggest one is cronyism. Not philosophically the biggest one, but in terms of the offense that I feel in my everyday life if I'm an average American trying to make it, you know, paycheck to paycheck. OK. So there's three. There's another. It's kind of maybe a semi-principle. It's not just what you say. It's how you say it and who you are when you say it. Nigel Farage and Donald Trump didn't just say, we've got to not do politics as usual. We've got to stand up to the establishment. They represented it in their language, in their look, in their vernacular, in everything, right? 
with Donald Trump, it was really interesting because he, he took a risk. <laughs> he really went to town on that, right? Um, he, he put so much clear blue water through uh, between him and, um, you know, Capitol Hill, if you like, in terms of manner, that a lot of us thought, well, there's no way he can win coming off that brash, that rude, that offensive, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there you go. Shows the power of it, right? Um, in a much more English way, Nigel Farage uh, in the UK uh, would very often be seen with a pint of beer and a cigarette leaning on a bar. That was how you saw Nigel Farage. And more than that, he would, he would frame his statements as a person speaking to the political establishment. Trump did that a lot. When everybody else on the issue of Europe was speaking as a politician to the people, right? So he wasn't just saying he was taking a different approach. He actually was, right, in the perspective that he took when he made a statement about Europe, he was speaking as a voter to the political class rather than as a politician to the voter. And when I say that, it probably sounds really obvious, but we don't do it enough. We don't do it enough. Um, okay, so yeah, so there's a, there's a um, what do I want to say, a consistency with both Trump and Farage uh, between the change that he's uh, seeking and the change that he's being. It's, it's, it's a corollary of the Gandhi uh, thing, right, for politics. The political uh, corollary of the most famous Gandhi quote, you know, be the change uh, that you seek in the world. It's really good in insurgent politics. It's really important. Okay. Bernie Sanders, let me just mention him as well, because this was also going on to a, a significant, maybe lesser, but a very significant extent on the left. Um, so I'm talking now about, let's say, the world of left-wing politics, uh, the, the progressive world, um, the last presidential cycle. I talked about reflecting back to people what they already feel. During the presidential election in 2016, 2015-2016, uh, um, one of the things that Bernie's campaign did that was interesting was they put out this nice little eight-minute video on uh, the unfair distribution of wealth and income in the United States, as he called it. And it was one of those nicely, you know, lots of like, nice graphics, nicely produced videos. Um, and the first five and a half minutes of that video was, as far as I could tell, accurate statements about uh, the distribution of wealth and income in the United States. And the last two and a half minutes were all of his socialist, highly progressive, uh, I would say, make the problem worse, solutions. Right? But it was very interesting because at that time, Rand Paul was still running, right? Maybe, arguably the most libertarian Republican in the pack of whatever it was back then, 14 or 16 Republicans. And um, I actually wrote an article uh, along the lines of, uh, I think I called it, as, as Bernie and Trump push the right buttons, the liberty movement must wake up. And I pointed out in the article that um, <clears throat> Rand Paul actually could have produced the exact same first five and a half minutes of that video, but changed the last two and a half minutes. So instead of giving Bernie Sanders uh, massive more taxation solutions, he could have given actual capitalist, free market, voluntary solutions to the problem that the first five, first five and a half minutes um, of the uh, video set up. Last night we heard from Ron Paul, and uh, you may remember that he talked about uh, how we don't have a true voluntary free market sector, we have crony corporatism, and uh, that explains some of the unfairness that does exist in wealth distribution, not among the top 1%, but among the top 0.05% perhaps. As I'm sure everybody in this room knows, uh, certain, you know, if you are a, uh, a banker that works for a certain kind of financial corporate, you have privileges to do things with money that if we did it, we would get locked up for, right? Um, so Ron Paul's point was well taken last night, and Bernie, therefore, also had a point in his eight-minute video about uh, the distribution of wealth in America. Bernie's folks on the left, that's his political world, a lot of students, right? A lot of students with student debt. 
Student debt is such an easy issue for us to win on, us as people who love the free market, who love liberty. It's just such a good example of the state getting in bed with financial corporates, right? We know how it goes, yeah? Uh, the state's going to guarantee, using taxpayers' money, the profits of the financial corporates that give the money to the students so they can pay their fees. So the schools know they can increase the fees, the tuition fees, as much as they want, the students will always be able to borrow the money because there will always be companies willing to lend it to them even though they can't pay it back because it's all backstopped with taxpayers' money. Now, great example of the road to hell, being paid for good intentions, right? We're going to make more money available to students for education. But actually what happens is the education becomes prohibitively expensive and students are getting no better education, but now they're leaving school with up to $100,000 debt. And it sets them back. Students get that. That's a gift. That's Bernie Sanders' audience. What Rand Paul could have done was have stated the same problem in exactly the same way and outflanked the left on the left. What you can do is you can say, you know, there's no taxation system progressive enough to solve the problem that we keep creating if all we're going to do is treat the political and economic symptoms of problems that we create. We need to treat the causes. We just had a doctor uh, on the stage. I learned the word iatrogenic uh, from uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb right, in his book Anti-Fragile, which I recommend, by the way. Uh, iatrogenic is a, is a largely medical term, but I've put it in my political book, if you can keep it, $17.76. Um, to, it means doing harm when you're trying to cure something. Right? It, it's politics. Right? This, is, this is most of what we're running against. Yeah? This is most of what we're running against. So um, the point, the reason I'm talking about Bernie Sanders here is what Bernie was doing was reflecting back what people felt, specifically describing the problem in a way that they understood that spoke to them. And I want to say to us in this room, to people who love liberty, to libertarians, that we need to describe the problem in the way that resonates. Because doing that is how you get somebody to accept your solution. It's more important to, to reflect the problem back in a way that lands than it is to give the great argument based on good facts right, about the solution. People will hear your solution, whatever it is, once you connected with them on the problem. That's a that's an important principle. And we saw a successful insurgency on the left that was done that way. Um, OK. Now, that's all very well, Robin. But uh, so we, we know what we need to be talking about um, in our messaging, perhaps. Uh, speak into that sense of injustice, unmediated by a political ideology. Got all of that. But um, how do we get anybody to hear our message? Like, where are we going to put this message? How are we going to get people actually to you know, read it, to want to read it? How are we going to reach them? We don't have a lot of resources relative to the main parties. We do not have massive brand recognition like the Democrats or the Republicans do. Um, we don't have much of a base. Uh, and I would say, although I've had some discussions this weekend about it, um, Although most people don't know what libertarian really is, I think that of those who do, the net reaction averaged across those that do is probably more negative than positive. I think we do have a branding issue. Cognitive dissonance is a very powerful psychological thing, or rather, the need to not experience cognitive dissonance, the need to resolve it. Um, if I have a great idea, and we've heard, we've told ourselves a lot this conference how we have the great ideas being uh, libertarians. But it, if we're right about that, and we really do have great ideas, um, it's a damn shame to stick a label on the ideas that people are going to do that when they see. Now, I'm working with a candidate up in Seattle, a wonderful candidate uh, called Matt Dubin. And I want to recommend him to you. Um, I'm doing uh, communications and strategy for him. He's a wonderful individual. He's a wonderful libertarian. Um, and he's running as a libertarian, uh, an LP guy. And um, we're running in an 87% Democratic district, like a challenge. And uh, when he hired me, I said, right, if 
if you're going to let me at this, um, we're not going to run a political campaign. We're going to start a movement. Because that's the only way, if you do all of these things, these four principles, what you end up with is a movement. It doesn't look like a political campaign. It doesn't feel like a political campaign. Did Trump's campaign feel much like a political campaign? Not a normal one. I mean, we knew he was doing politics. We knew that's what he was doing. We knew it. But it, it didn't feel like usual. Ron Paul, back in, in the day of Blue Republican, and uh, you know, the, the Ron Paul revolution, the love revolution, it felt like a movement. Of course it does. We've heard also rightly this conference a few times uh, the, I, the idea that culture precedes politics. To a first approximation, that is definitely true. In my opinion, I could do a whole other speech about that. But, um, <clears throat> but I think that makes sense of the idea of why it should be that a successful insurgency feels like a movement, i.e. feels like something going on in the culture with a kind of political change in its wake. OK, so um, I said to Matt in Seattle, we're going to start a movement. Uh, now, how do you start a movement in an 87% Democratic district uh, that's going to make people vote libertarian? Well, first of all, you've got to do all the things that I said. right? So what is the felt injustice in downtown Seattle? You'd think 87% district, Demo Democratic district, everyone's uh, you know, just fine, thanks. Um, Maybe, maybe we shouldn't bother. Uh, but of course, we, we were going to bother. Um, and there is a problem. There is a problem, I believe. And I discussed this with Matt at our first meeting. An injustice, uh, certainly a disaffection, that we could sell into. Now, I didn't know if the injustice was big enough. Um, but no, let me, let me take that back. I didn't know if there were a critical mass of people who felt it as soon as we started that campaign, that we could hit kind of like escape velocity and, and really churn up politics in Seattle. But Matt and I agreed that even if we run this campaign, and I'm going to tell you how we did it in a moment, even if, if we did it, if we try to start this movement and we spoke to this injustice that we agreed upon, um, we might be a few months early, we might be a few weeks early, maybe we'll be a year early, but we're on the right curve. We've got the right thing. And that thing, that we, the injustice that we decided to speak into, to sell our movement into, right, to exploit, if you like, is the fact that even in progressive downtown Seattle, beautiful Seattle, all of our political solutions involve otherizing, involve looking at one part of the community and saying, you're the us, you're the them, we're going to take from the them to give to the us. That's how we solve every problem that affects us. And depending on the issue, the us and them are different. Right? So the us could be progressives and the them could be conservatives. That's the obvious one. But when it comes to city politics, it's more like, let's say if I'm a progressive, the us is the homeless people. We have a, lot of, we have a massive homeless issue in Seattle. So it's the homeless folks and those who care about the homeless folks. The them is the evil property tax payers, because they're tight and they don't want to let their property tax go up for these people who need it. Right? The us and the them. Heard about the head tax? In Seattle recently? Yeah, right? Oh my god, let's tax jobs. The same people that actually give tax breaks to specific companies to increase jobs are supporting taxing. You can't make this stuff up, but you can't. You, you, I don't need to tell you. This is, this is socialist politics. Um, and Seattle, by the way, is a city where we actually have a self-described socialist on the council. Uh, one of the biggest otherizers, I would say. Um, and I'm otherizing by saying that, maybe. But uh, one of the biggest us versus them kind of political movers in the city. Um, so the head tax, right? Well, again, there's the us is uh, poorer people in my beautiful home city. The them is the evil companies that keep coming in, giving lots of people jobs so they can afford more expensive rents. You know. Um, but, but there it is. It's the us versus them. The us versus them. Now, obviously, people who vote the 80-whatever percent Democratic base in Seattle, people who vote Democratic, they think they're voting against us versus them. It's the politics of the left. It's the politics of good intent. right? It's the politics of universalism. Um, I, I go into some uh, depth about this. You know, what, I, what psychologically is the politics of the left and what is the politics of the right? They're asymmetrical. I go into some depth about that in my course, Weapons of Mass Persuasion. Um, so you can learn more there. But for my purposes here, 
I want to just mention that if the politics of the left are the politics of universalism, of good intent, the, legal, the, the manifesting in law and governance of my good intention, and we're trying to reach those, then you need a hook. You need a hook for your liberty individualist message that is going to land for such a progressive population. So the, the slogan that I am really proud of that Matt is running on is, there is no them. That's the libertarian campaign in Seattle. A libertarian campaign Thanks, I like to think, to my work on the messaging and psychology side, but most of all to Matt's work for picking up that phone and actually getting out and doing the work, going to the meetings and fundraising. We are dollar for dollar matched right now with the Democratic incumbent as for state representative in Seattle. 50 grand. 50 grand in the bank. We haven't even got to the primary yet. All there is is Matt and this message. There is no them. We put up signs all over the district just yard signs, right? I mean, we've got a few more th cool things going on, which I'll tell you about. But um, we've got the yard signs, but we don't put Matt Dubin for state rep. Matt Dubin L for state rep. Because anything I see after that, if I'm not interested in that race and I'm not interested in L, I'm not interested in what you're going to tell me, right? My cognitive defenses are all up. Um, no, what we're doing is just putting up signs that say, there is no them dot us. What's that about? People don't know what it's about. But they kind of like it because it's, it's reflecting back a progressive sentiment. And then they go to the website. And then they see Matt doing a fantastic two-minute video on there is no them dot us. There is no them dot us. Get it? It's not a, it's, that's not a political website. It's not Matt Dubin for Washington dot whatever. Right? It's not that. It's there is no them. We're starting to reflect back the dissatisfaction. The story that I heard that prompted me to you know, say to Matt that I think this is the way we should go. There's actually a story about a friend of mine at uh, University of Washington who um, teaches history. And uh, she was, she's doing a PhD. As I told you, she's a teaching assistant, and she does a class in, in, in uh, history. And she found herself under some intimidation because she refused to cancel her class on a day of an anti-Trump rally. That's how crazy it's got at UW. Um, now, I know this is, being, this is being listened to. So uh, some people might hear this at UW. Um, but I, uh, but, so just let me be clear. This is not a pro-Trump individual. This is just somebody that wanted to give her students their education that they paid for on that day like every other day. But, you know, solidarity from the leftists in her, in her department, right? No, no, no. You, she felt quite pressured by that. I told that story at a panel on identity politics in Seattle. And an individual came up to me after the class and said, a middle-aged man, he said, Robin, that uh, story you told about uh, UW, he said, you know, I just want you to let you know it's completely accurate. And I said, oh, how do you know? He said, because uh, I'm a lecturer there. And um, you know what? When I tell this story in other places, I, I say what department and what he, he's in and what he teaches, but I'm not going to do that because I don't want to get him in trouble. But um, <clears throat> he said, I have to give, uh, it was like next month or next semester, a course on diversity in his field, which I'm going to try not to name. Um, and he said, and I'm absolutely terrified. <laughs> and I said, why is that? He said, because some of the students of color in my class uh, who are not sharing, have told him that they're not sharing their political views because they're not left enough for some of the liberals in his class. And um, what made this all the better an anecdote was this individual was himself black. I went to lunch with him sometime after, and uh, we talked about this problem of you know, the ideological takeover of the cultural commanding heights like education. And he told me that when he was a boy, he actually did have to sit at the back of the bus because of the color of his skin. This is a guy who knows racism, and he was terrified. At the university in the city my candidate is running in, giving a class on diversity, how far we have come. Right? So I had this data, because I go out giving these speeches and I'm talking to people, that I think we're already there. We're already at the tipping point where people are going, this is crazy. And in that room when I told that story, and that gentleman came up to me to tell me about his experience as a professor at the university. 
It was a complete, it was a cross, there was no, there may have been one or two libertarians, but it was a standard establishment political conference. It was leaning democratic because I was in Seattle. There's Republicans and Democrats, mostly Democrats. And the Democrats came up to me afterwards and they said, yeah, you know, yeah, this is a problem. So then I, so I see an opportunity here. The opportunity is, political opportunity is, decent people, common, just maybe who aren't as into politics as we are, but just decent people who care enough to even show up to conferences and identify Democratic or Republican, are realizing, I think, more and more that they need to talk, they have more in common with the decent people with the other letter after the name than they do with the extremes on their own side, right? Political opportunity. There hasn't been a political figure in Seattle, and I would say maybe the country, yeah, the country, that has actually just said it, led, actually called it, actually reflected back explicitly, like Farage did, like Trump did in a very different way, that feeling of disaffection. In other words, nobody's come out and created the safe space, used advisedly, politically, for people to actually say, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, that's where I'm at, and create that that discussion. Now, obviously, it is happening. I mean, there's so many indicators of this, right? Look at the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. Absolutely. Like, what more evidence do you need? Um, the fact that uh, other individuals, uh, Candace Owens, I think, would be a good one. There's so much of this is already starting in the culture. See, culture precedes politics. So what you need is the politician to come up and say it. Matt's that guy in Seattle. As I say, when we started the campaign, we didn't know if we were going to be a little too far ahead of the curve. And then they did the head tax. We were like, ah, we nailed it. <laughs> we were just got it right. Because we're already standing in that space. We're saying that the problem with the head tax is it's, it's a great example of us versus them. Yeah? It's a political solution that isn't interested in human outcomes, which is what the left experience themselves as being interested in. It's about, we'll take from those guys to give to those guys. It's punishment politics. And uh, plenty of Democrats in the district are not comfortable with it. Political opportunity, we got there first. That's how you can create a political insurgency. Now, can I say for sure that all of this great campaign apply applying these principles uh, is going to you know, produce amazing results by the time the primary happens in a couple of months or the general happens for Matt Dubin, who's running for state representative? I don't know, because it takes time to build a movement. But I know it's going in the right direction, because I know the feedback we're getting. I know, I'm, I'm having meetings with Democrats who say things, right? Um, like, yeah, I'm a Democrat. I've been driving around the, the district. I've just been loving the signs. Eventually, I looked it up. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about it. Oh, I didn't realize there was a political candidate there. Now, I mentioned cognitive dissonance. Let me, let me just actually bring this round to, as it were, another messaging principle. You can either have cognitive dissonance working against you or with you. If we put up a bunch of signs that said, Matt Dubin, libertarian for you know, Washington state or whatever, and then a little slogan, there is no them, everyone now political sign, political slogan. Right? The cognitive dissonance would work against us. They would re their reaction to the L would mean that we can't land the message of there is no them. They're, they're, they're not one of those. They put us in that box, oh, those freaky L people, or well, I don't even know what an L is, so it can't be important, whatever it might be. Right? So that we don't get the message in. If we lead with the message, if we lead with the injustice, and then the candidate comes up behind, he doesn't just have to say, it's not about me. It's about the way we're doing politics. He doesn't just have to say that. We are saying that. He doesn't, he's not just saying that. He's showing that. Trump showed that he wasn't one of the swamp. Maybe he's a different swamp, but he showed in his manner, right? Farage, with his beer and his cigarette, talking as a, one of the people, two politicians rather than the other way around, showed that he wasn't one of them. Um, so by leading with the message that speaks to the feeling of injustice that resonates, what happens is if the, that message is targeted for the self-identification of the audience, there is no them, a highly progressive phrase when you first hear it, a highly universalist phrase when you first hear it, and therefore targeted to you know, the psychology of left-wing politics. Right? If you lead with that and then somebody has had the experience of, I liked that, I liked it enough to go to the website to check it out, and then they see the L, you've got them. 
because now you've reframed the L and you're getting their cognitive dissonance or their need to avoid cognitive dissonance to work for you, they're going to look at the, what that L means again. Because what they've just discovered is, well, the message, I actually kind of liked it. They can't make themselves wrong, right? Here's a, here's a fundamental principle of political messaging, right? Don't make the guy wrong, make him right. Right? When you're selling your paradigm to somebody with a different paradigm, it's not a clash of paradigms. What you do is you find the bit of his paradigm over here, which you can use against his bit of his paradigm over here and show him his own inconsistency. Right? So you're not actually you know, causing the person you're talking to bring up those cognitive defenses. I've got to resist what this guy's telling me. He's coming from a different worldview, and if I accept it, I've got to throw mine out. Right? You're not doing that. You're, rather, you're helping somebody clarify their mind with the things they already believe. Right? Help them explore their own inconsistency. We all have them. Um, so that's what we're doing when, when we're like, applying these, these messaging principles. When we make it land, we have to lead with the thing that reflects back to the person we're talking to who they are. Right? So it's there is no them first. It's Matt Dubin, libertarian for Washington, second. Cognitive, use the need to avoid cognitive dissonance to reframe the thing that's tricky. And the thing that's tricky, in my experience, as a liberty political psychologist and communications guy is the L brand. Right? And it's the L brand that we actually want to bring people into. It's the, our philosophy, the libertarian philosophy, that we want people to uh, you know, explore with us. Right? So let's not go at them. Let's invite them in by letting them know with our, clevers, our clever, and they have to be clever, political slogans or messages, um, uh, that w letting them know that we know who they are and what moves them. That's what there is no them does. How am I doing for time? 9.35. Oh, I better wrap up then, right? OK, right, so then I will wrap up with this. Well, that's all very well. Um, but there's still another piece of it, which is, None of this will do anything unless enough people see your brilliant message carefully crafted to reflect back the injustice that they already feel. Right? And we don't have the kind of resources of the R's and the D's. And that is a thing. And not only is that a thing, we all know in this room that um, uh, the official manifestation of the liberty movement in electoral politics, the Libertarian Party, for example, uh, also suffers from a non-level playing field. And I bet this is your meat and drink, Carla, right? Um, you know, we know it's stacked against us. We don't have the resources. So we have to play a different game. I say to candidates something like this. The R's and the D's are over there having their big party. They always have this big party. They invite all their friends. All their friends come because they know they get lots of food and drink, right? It's always a great party, and it goes on every year. We can't compete in that party. I don't, mean, you know, I don't mean like political party. This is an analogy, right? An event going on. Imagine an event going on, right? The cool kids on the block over here with loads of money. We've got to do something. We, we, we can't do that. We can't, we can't hire out the big venue. We can't be giving away the most expensive champagne. What we have to do is create a more interesting, curious game over here or event over here, right? That's what our campaign, actually, movement needs to be. We've got to do something that's so different that the difference, the, 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 the fact of its difference is itself a story. We've got to do something that earns media by virtue of what we're doing, let alone what we're saying, right? You know, there isn't a libertarian-friendly media in most of America, right? But if you start being creative, you're basically doing something that's worthy of a story. For example, one of the ideas that um, is kind of fun, um, again, I, I don't know what it's going to deliver to us, but it's just an example that, that I want to give you, that, um, an idea that we're using in, in Seattle, is we've had There Is No Them put on beer mats. And we're going around the businesses. Matt's just awesome reaching out to businesses, to the people in his community. Um, and if they like our message, Give them some free beer mats. That means people are going to be re-drinking their beer, not thinking about politics, not receiving the message in the context of uh, politics. What the hell's this thing at the bottom of my glass? Oh, there is no them, dot US. What's that about? OK. Now, we're playing it differently. Now, we've got to get to a critical mass. But the fact that we're playing it differently, the fact that we're getting people interested, which is itself, like nothing succeeds like success, right, is itself um, a story. We're getting 
unusual numbers of people interested in unusual ways. That's how we earn the media. That's how we earn the media that we can't afford. Again, Matt, brilliant, goes to speak um, at the, uh, the city council, at the head tax vote. Great earned media. There we are on the Fox affiliate in Seattle. Now he's identified with being on the right side of that issue. And I don't mean right as in conservative. I mean the side of the issue that is uncomfortable, including lots of Democrats who see that their city council voted 9-0 for this head tax. Right? It's like, there's no issue here. 9-0, it's a slam dunk, right? Well, the people don't feel that's a slam dunk. Amazon has 19% of all the office space in Seattle. 19%, <laughs> right? There's a lot of people who vote Democrat, who are progressive, who work for Amazon, <laughs> right? Who think, you know, this might not be the, the smartest way of solving this problem. Now, of course, it's not only about throwing money at the problem. It's about, um, are we measuring our compassion by the good that we do? That's another line we're using a lot, right? We're, Matt just put out a meme. Uh, we need to measure our compassion by the good that we do, not the money we spend. It's a line I've been using for a while. But now, it, everybody knows what it means, right? Democrats, too. We spend 17,000, ah, between 16 and $17,000 per homeless individual in Seattle. It's enough to put them in a brand new studio apartment. And we have, is it the second, third biggest homeless problem in Seattle? It's getting worse. And, and a lot of these individuals are lucky if they just get a shelter for the night. Only government can spend money that badly. Right? But we're not against government. We're for actually delivering on the good intent. Let's measure our compassion by the good that we do. There's common ground to talk about the head tax. OK, if we're going to take more money, can we be sure that we're actually delivering the outcomes that we're taking the money for? If not, where's our responsibility, our moral responsibility? If you're a Democrat or a Republican, a liberal or a conservative, it doesn't matter. You have massive common ground on. If you are taking money, by force, you know, if they're taking tax money by whatever means, to spend on people who need it, the moral obligation is to get the biggest bang for the buck with each dollar, right? To get the most economic and moral bang for the buck for each dollar. The conservatives like it because they want to spend less money. The progressives like it because they want to do more good. Common ground. That's Matt's ground. It's ground that, fall, that, you, that you can hook naturally on the idea of let's stop otherizing. Let's look at the methods by which we deliver outcomes. We do it in every area of life, right? Every area of life, if we want to change the outcomes, we look at the methods we use. We don't do that in politics. We just throw more money down the same old method that doesn't work, and that is morally irresponsible. And people are open to how morally irresponsible it is when they're seeing things in the news like the head tax. Okay. Um, I better wrap up then. Uh, a successful political insurgency means that we're asking people to do something they've probably never done. Vote third party, vote libertarian. We have no right to expect them to do that unless we give them an experience they've never had, which is why they discover there is no them at the bottom of their beer glass. Right? We want something. Brand new from them, we've got to give them a brand new um, experience. We have to do that with a lot of people. I'm really excited, and I, I mean that. I, I'm not just throwing, you know, using that word loosely. I'm really excited by what I've heard this weekend uh, among my fellow libertarians, especially my fellow uh, libertarians in the LP. There's, I think we're getting to a... a a, a, a critical point, like a threshold of we know we need to understand this. Um, and a lot of this, I think, is, is about our own humility, right? Like knowing that we can't just stay in what we know. There are things that we don't know that we could know better that uh, could make us more successful. Um, and I think, as Alex Merced said uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, you know, actually lives depend on us getting this stuff right. Um, so I will, I'll end this with a quote from my uncle who died a few years ago as one of Britain's, Britain's richest men and uh, Britain's best ever selling poet. Um, also, he was a great cultural libertarian. His name was Felix Dennis, and he was a private publisher. He published magazines like Maxim and Mac User and lots of famous things you'll have heard of. And he, One of his uh, poems that he performed on stage ends with... Um, Knowing isn't doing what you need to do, my son.
telling me you know is just bluffing on the run. Knowing isn't doing. Doing isn't knowing. Nothing but the knowing and the doing gets it done. That's my message to the LP, to all the liberty movement. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Time for questions or not? Okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> I wonder if That's interesting. there's an issue that is that involved for as many, many, many Americans regarding whether we talk about it, mm. but because so few people, well, percentage-wise, so few people go to college, I find that it doesn't have a large attraction. Yeah, you're, you're right. Yes, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't run a, let's say, a national campaign or, or even a, well, any city campaign on that because that's a, uh, but your question is a great question because it speaks to a, actually something much bigger, um, which I also talk about in Weapons of Mass Persuasion. Uh, and maybe I should even have included it in the speech already. When your right to due process was taken away, NDAA and Patriot Act, did all those marches in the street? No, none. Not one. Rights that genuinely do go back to Magna Carta. Genuinely, just right? People like me, and I'm sure lots of folks in this room were, were arguing, writing against the travesty that was Patriot Act and NDAA, right? But nobody, nobody moves, nobody does anything, nobody gets too upset. However, if I'm a gun owner, for example, and you slightly increase the regulation, let's say in my, this actually happened in Seattle, um, on my guns, I get very upset and politically active. The most successful anti-tax movement in this country in modern times has been, get this, the vaping community. In state after state after state, they have managed to make it impossible to tax the vape uh, fluid that, you know, theretofore had not been taxed. It goes to your question, and I talk about this in my book as well. People don't become insurgent politically. They don't pay the price of political action. They don't vote different if the right that's taken away from me is not a right I use and experience using in my daily life. It's not the size of the right. It's the extent to which it speaks to who I am. If I'm a gun owner, that gun is part of my identity. If I'm a vapor, an e-vapor, whatever, that is part of my identity. You come for that, you come for me. It feels bigger than the, um, than the right to due process. Why? Because unless right now, today, I'm needing due process, it is an abstraction. That's why Snowden was important. Writers like me and hundreds of others, thousands of others, were saying there's something wrong with what the government's doing with surveillance, right? A lot of us in the liberty movement were passionate about it. Nobody got that upset until Snowden came along and changed that... Um, uh, political, the removal of a political right, right, the, the Fourth Amendment, right, that made it an actual felt change in everyday life, right? Because now, as an American, after Snowden, you make a phone call, it doesn't quite feel the same anymore, does it? You got friends who put the little thing on the, the, the camera, right? Somebody thinks twice about having an intimate video chat with their loved one or something like that. It's, it's now in the culture. It's in our everyday life, right? And it was on the back of Snowden that you had that vote in Congress that almost, almost changed it, right? So, so to your point, it's about finding the, the issue in wherever you're running that does go to identity if you can, that goes to... Um, felt experience. Um, is there something that I'm actually enjoying today that I seriously risk not having tomorrow, even though I was taking it for granted yesterday? That's the thing that you find. It changes in different districts. My campaign in Seattle wouldn't work in, um, in another city, for example, right? Matt's campaign wouldn't work. Um, in New Mexico, where I branded a libertarian 
campaign down there. I don't, know, I don't know, any longer work with this candidate. I just did his upfront branding. Um, he was, you know, whatever his name was, uh, for New Mexico. And I was like, oh, this, is just, this isn't going to work. You can't, you're a political insurgent. You're an LP guy. That's not going to work. So the slogan I came up with down there was, after, after some discussion with uh, the people in his community, um, actually in Albuquerque, what is it, what's the problem, what's the felt problem about being New Mexican? Well, what's already there that bothers people? Tell me what the disaffection is. We went around the table for about an hour, and they told me what it was. They said, well, we feel lost. On, like, we're at the bottom of the pile for everything. We've just like, given up. Right? It's just, that's what, to be New Mexico, a New Mexican is to feel like, like just everything is kind of the worst of America. I said, and the phrase I came up with for them was the political brand, last no more. N-M. Beautiful. So the website isn't this individual for New Mexico, it's lastnomore.us. You see I have a bit of a pattern, right? See how I work, right? Um, so different thing for different places, and uh, I mean, I'm happy to talk more about, I think I've got to get off the stage. Yeah, but uh, thanks for the question, it's a really good one. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, thank you.